Okay, you can turn in your Bible to the book of 2 Thessalonians. We're going to look at pre-trib rapture scriptures in the book of 2 Thessalonians. And I want to warn you, right at the very beginning, if you are a post-tribber, uh, you're going to come out of this thing with a migraine headache, and, and uh, you're just going to have to keep your fingers in your ears through most of it. Because again, uh, your position, believing that the body of Christ goes through the what you would call the tribulation, uh, goes through most of the events of the book of Revelation, uh, it's destroyed again. Sorry. Um, as ironic, I actually had to ban one of these post-trib heretics, and I got on his channel, you know, and he's Steven Anderson worshiper, but uh, I had to ban one of these guys. He just kept on coming back and coming back and coming back and coming back, you know, man that's an heretic after the first and second in admonition reject. Titus chapter 3 verses 9 through 11 talks about that. But the whole point is, he made a statement on one of these uh, sermons I did on the one on Romans, Pre-trib rapture scriptures in Romans, and he said, There is not, you didn't say one true thing in this whole sermon, you're a deceiver. Now that shows a very high degree of ignorance of how Satan would deceive people. You see, Satan, when he deceives, he tells a whole lot of truth and mixes in a couple lies. Satan will never deceive anybody by lying completely 100% of the time. That's not how it works. A deceiver will tell a lot of truth with a little bit of error. So for somebody to say, I didn't tell the truth one time in the entire sermon, uh, shows their uh, incredible wickedness and ignorance as well. But you know, I went through this, this book this morning and uh, the whole book of Second Thessalonians read through the whole thing going through it and it's just like, there's a lot of these books that you have some scriptures that don't, they're not real crystal clear, you know, things there's, Paul's writing about other topics or issues or whatever and they don't specifically point at proving a rapture before the time of Jacob's trouble but I'll tell you what the book of 2nd Thessalonians it's almost the whole thing uh, it's incredible let's look at it 2nd Thessalonians chapter 1 verses 1 and 2 Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus under the church of the Thessalonians in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ grace unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. If you've been following this, you know exactly where I'm going to go next. Keep your finger right there in 2 Thessalonians and go to Revelation chapter 6. This is just one of those very common simple things uh, that you can destroy the whole post-trib system with just something as simple as this. Revelation chapter 6, verse 1. And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. So who was it that opened the first seal? The Lamb. Who is the Lamb? Jesus Christ. Go down to verse 4. And there went out another horse that was red, and power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, and that they should kill one another, and there was given unto him a great sword. So who was it that took peace from the earth? You say, the red horse rider. Okay, who unleashed the red horse rider? The lamb. Who is the lamb? Jesus. So how can he say, you, I give you peace, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 2, grace unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I give you peace, and now I take it from the earth. Put on the body of Christ. You say, but we can have peace in the midst of this peace being taken from the earth. That doesn't make any sense. You say, well, well, there have been bad times for Christians. Yeah, but God didn't cause them. Notice it's the lamb that's taking that peace. He unleashes the red horse rider to take peace from the earth. We have peace today as Christians, knowing that whatever happens to us, it's happening from the devil and his people. We don't have to worry about all of a sudden realizing our Father, God, and the Lord Jesus Christ have just taken peace from us. They're, they're the ones that are bringing the persecution. They're the ones that have caused us to be tortured for our faith. That doesn't happen. And these post-tribbers, they'll bring that stuff up. What about the martyrs? If we, get, if we escape before you know, any bad things happen, what about the martyrs? They didn't escape. Uh, the martyrs were not killed by Jesus Christ. Okay. The Catholic Church killed them, not the Church of Jesus Christ. That's the Church of Satan, the true Church of Satan. I mean, you'd think that these people could understand that after a while, but apparently not. 
turn back to Second Thessalonians chapter one, verse three. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is meet, because that your faith groweth, groweth exceedingly, and the charity of every one of you all toward each other aboundeth, so that we ourselves glory in you in the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that ye endure. Who's bringing the persecutions and tribulations? The lost world. You say, how do you know? Keep reading. That's a good way to, to figure things out in Scripture. Keep reading. Context. In other words... Verse 5, which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God, that ye may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God, for which ye also suffer. Okay? It's a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God. What does that mean? You're suffering persecution, you're suffering tribulation, and that is going to bring God's persecution, His judgment, excuse me, His judgment upon the lost world. Verse 6, seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. So in other words, see the context here. Verse 3, sorry, verse 4, the uh, uh, persecutions and tribulations that ye endure, the lost world attacking us. Verse 5, it's a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God. They deserve it. When God is rough on the Vatican, when God does bad things to the Vatican and all these other, you know, Muslims and whatever, daughters of the great whore, when God is, is, is judgmental upon them, it's because they have persecuted the body of Christ. Verse 6, seeing is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. So to bring up the argument about what about the martyrs and try to say because martyrs have suffered at the hands of the lost world, therefore the church is going to suffer in the time of Jacob's trouble. The time of Jacob's trouble, first of all, it's, I use that term, that's the biblical term, it's never called the Great Tribulation. It's the time of Israel's trouble because they have rejected Jesus Christ as their Messiah. That's the whole reason for the time. But you see, that time period, it's going to be God's judgment and wrath coming upon a world that has rejected Jesus Christ, not his church. The martyr argument just falls flat on its face. God never persecuted one martyr. He never tortured them. He never said, hey, I'm glad my servant, the Catholic Church, is down there torturing those Christians. I'll torture the body of Christ, the body of Christ that's connected to me, because, you know, he is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is God. So, I mean, how does that work? Again, the post-tribber's arguments just are ridiculous. But uh, let's continue. Verse 7. And to you who are troubled, rest with us, when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, uh, at the second coming there, um, wouldn't it be, you know, if Jesus is coming with his mighty angels, we're going to see who they are in a minute, but if he's coming with his mighty angels, uh, well, how does that work? Flaming fire taking, in, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Wouldn't there be some righteous people there, some Christians, members of the body of Christ that that comes upon? No, because we're not there. We're not there on the earth. We're the ones coming back with Jesus Christ. I'll show you that here as we continue. Verse 9, Who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power, when He shall come to be glorified in His saints and to be admired in all them that believe, because our testimony among you was believed in that day. Jesus is going to be glorified in all of His saints. Why? Because we are the mighty angels that are coming back with him and we're going to give him glory when we see him personally, one man, take out the Antichrist and the false prophet and then that 200 million man army at the Battle of Armageddon. One man versus 200 million. I know it's not much of a fair fight for the Lord Jesus, but you know, <laughs> that's all they could muster, you know, just 200 million man army against the God of heaven, and he wipes them out. Very interesting. Okay, we're going to go to Colossians 3, verse 4. I'm going to show you here the proof that these angels that come back um, 
with Jesus Christ at the second coming, that those angels are the blood-redeemed saints of the New Testament. Colossians chapter 3, verse 4. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Remember when he comes to be glorified in all of his saints? See the tie in there? When, he, when Christ, who is our life, you're connected to Jesus Christ if you're saved, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. When he appears at the second coming, we appear with him in glory. We are bringing glory to Jesus Christ, and we are in our own glorified bodies, conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. That's how this thing works. Go next to Jude. There's only one chapter. So Jude, chapter 1, verses uh, 14 and 15. Okay, it says here, And Enoch also the seventh from Adam prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. You know, it's interesting because you see this whole thing over and over and over again with the rapture and then the time of Jacob's trouble. It's, there's a huge distinction between saved and lost. The saved are having to be removed before God's judgment comes upon the lost world. And we come back as blood-redeemed saints. We come as ten thousands of his saints with Jesus to execute judgment upon that lost world. Go next to Revelation 19. Revelation chapter 19, verse 1. We'll start there. It says here, And after these things I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. For true and righteous are his judgments. For he hath judged the great whore, which did corrupt the earth with her fornication, and hath avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. And again they said, Alleluia, and her smoke rose up forever and ever. Let me just stop there for a minute. This is the destruction of Roman Catholicism, the mother church. Okay, Mystery Babylon, Revelation chapter 17 describes her. It's not America, okay? It's not Israel, it's not the Illuminati, it is Mystery Babylon, Roman Catholicism. Her colors are purple and scarlet, not blue and white for Israel, or red, white, and blue for America, or something like this. Purple and scarlet, the colors of the cardinals and the bishops in Roman Catholicism. Look it up, okay? Anybody tells you it's, it's something other than Roman Catholicism, they're lying to you. But you see, we are there to cheer the destruction of Roman Catholicism. And their biggest time of, of their biggest slaughter is yet to come in the time of Jacob's trouble. It's going to be horrible. Uh, that's why I preach these sermons, because I want to see people get saved and get out of that time. If you are saved, you're leaving before that time period. Uh, could the persecution come before the rapture? Sure, it could come. Um, but I think that that's going to be dependent on how hard we fight as Christians. I think that the Lord can certainly withhold these evil Satanists in the Roman Catholic Church, the Jesuit order that's running the Catholic Church right now. Um, he can withhold them, and we can fight that system back long enough until the rapture and we leave. And then at that point, the restraint is gone, which we're going to see here in a little bit. And it's just going to get really, really bad at that point in time. Uh, you think it's vexing out there right now as a Christian when you go out into the world. It is going to be ten times worse. Uh, well, not ten times. It's going to be more like ten thousand times worse <laughs> when we leave. And the restraint on lost people is gone. All saved people are leaving at the rapture. That's something to think about. Okay. Uh, but interesting that I just wanted to make that point that uh, Roman Catholicism really doesn't have that much longer to go. The whole mystery Babylon system that goes way back to ancient Babylon with Nebuchadnezzar and comes up through the media Persian and the Greeks and the Romans and then, you know, all that, that thing has only got a couple years left. Rapture happens, it's really, I don't know the exact time period of when the time of Jacob's trouble will start, but from then, it's only seven years. So the rapture happens this year, 
they only have seven years to go before they're totally wiped out. Hmm. You'd be a fool to stick with that system when your destruction is already written down in the King James Bible. But let's continue. Verse 4. And the four and twenty elders and the four beasts fell down and worshipped God that sat on the throne, saying, Amen, Alleluia. And a voice came out of the throne, saying, Praise our God, all ye his servants, and ye that fear him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. And he saith unto me, Write, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. Now look at this. Remember, the, the whole debate here is, Who are these angels that come back with Jesus Christ? Well, in Jude it says that they're the saints. And in Colossians there, it basically is saying the same thing. But check this out, verse 10. And I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said unto me, See, thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. You have an angel saying, Don't fall down and worship me. I'm of thy brethren, and I have the testimony of Jesus. Hmm. Who was that angel? Interesting. Verse 11. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. Is there any doubt who this is? No, it's Jesus. Verse 14, And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Who was it that just put on the fine linen, the white fine linen? That would have been the bride of Christ. Now she's mounted on horses, the bride of Christ, coming back with Jesus. I mean, is there any doubt who the armies are that come back with Jesus to execute judgment upon the lost world? No. It's the body of Christ. The body and the bride of Christ. They're one and the same. You say, well, how's that work? Well, if you read over in Ephesians chapter 5, the wife and the husband are one flesh. So we can be the bride of Christ and the body of Christ at the same time. Very interesting. Go back to 2 Thessalonians. We'll continue here with our study. But it's interesting there in verse 7, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 7, and to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. It's talking about us coming back with Jesus Christ. Now let me just say something that you should be able to understand here. Uh, even I think the most ignorant post-tribber should be able to get this. Um, in order for us to come down with Jesus, we had to first go up. Does that make sense? Okay. Okay. Um, well, the post-trib rapture happens at the end of the tribulation, they say. Okay, so we go up and make a U-turn. Up we go. Come up hither. Up we go. Come back down. We come back down with him at the Battle of Armageddon. When did the judgment seat of Christ happen? And you can read the writings of a lot of these post-trib heretics. They leave out the judgment seat of Christ. Hmm. Interesting. Almost like they don't want to be judged for what they've done in their life. How about that? You go up, you, be, you get glorified, marriage supper of the Lamb, you come back down. And by the way, I believe the marriage supper of the Lamb is actually down here on the earth. It's kind of like the marriage happens up there in heaven, the wedding, and then we get on horseback to ride to the, you know, restaurant, so, so to speak, where we're going to have the marriage supper. But on the way, Jesus says, to his new bride there, he says, Honey, watch this. I'm going to show you what kind of a man I am. See that 200 million man army down there? Check this out. <laughs> he whips them. Boom. Wiped out. But I've done other studies, so I'm not going to get into all that stuff. But uh, very interesting. 
But now let's go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Now I've been through this thing over and over and over again, and you know I'm still just kind of like looking at it, going, "Okay, Lord," I, you know, scratching my head, going, "The day of Christ. What is the day of Christ?" Now a lot of brethren will point to the other passages in your New Testament here, where it talks about the day of Christ being basically the rapture. Uh, another other parts say it's basically the judgment seat of Christ, and they say, "Well, then it has to be there, day of Christ, day of Christ. It has to mean the same thing." Well. I believe that you interpret things based on the context in, in which it appears. Now, in context here, you look at this thing and I say, okay, how could that be the rapture? You've got to do some really interesting things with the text to make this into the rapture. I believe in context, the day of Christ is speaking about the day of the Lord. Why? Why do I say that? Verse 2 at the beginning there, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, uh, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Now, if the day of Christ is the rapture, in every instance, why would we be troubled knowing that the day of Christ is at hand? It's almost here. I mean, if the Lord came to me and physically appeared, and I have him on camera, he's standing right here beside me, and he says, I'm going to reveal to you the day of the rapture. How many of you would be troubled by that? I certainly hope you wouldn't be. I mean, it'd be exciting. If he came and he showed up and he said, I'm going to show up on May the 7th or something. <laughs> you know, May 7th of 2016 is the rapture. We're leaving. Get things in order. We're going to be leaving. You're not going to be troubled by that. Why would you be troubled by that? See, I believe in context, what's going on here is these Thessalonian believers are being told by people forging Paul's name, basically, they're saying that the day of Christ is at hand, meaning that second coming. So the Thessalonian believers are going, the second coming is at hand? Did we miss the rapture? Did we miss being caught up or something? I guess we're, we're going to go into the time of Jacob's trouble here any minute or whatever. I think that that's what's going on. Let's continue reading. Verse 3. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Now a lot of the post trib heretics, like Kent Hovind, will stop at verse 3. They might go to verse 4, but usually they stop at verse 3. So they say, see, the Bible plainly teaches the two things have to happen. A falling away, the great apostasy. And number two, the Antichrist has to be revealed. So there, that proves that we have to be here at least, at the very least, to see the Antichrist being revealed. But if you keep reading in the text there, you see that uh, the second one there doesn't work. And we're going to see about that. But you've got to watch this thing. How these guys will just, all of a sudden, they're reading verses and they just go, boom, and they stop. Be very careful about that. But now let me ask you a question. Are we seeing a great falling away? Yes. Has the time come when people will not endure sound doctrine? Yes. <laughs> Definitely. Look at the comments on these videos I put out. Uh, it's incredible. Can you make it shorter? Can you just, you know, make this thing, you know, quicker or something? Can you just do it in five minutes? What's this hour-long preaching about? Eh. What's going on? They can't endure sound doctrine. You know, and they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. They'll look for people that just put out little quick things and stuff like this. They won't get into a lot of deep scripture and whatever. Yeah, we are in the falling away right now. Um, and it's not, you know, well, it could get much worse. Uh, that's not really the, the, the standard there. It's how much more is God going to put up with. Yeah, I mean, it could just keep getting worse and worse and worse. But the point is, God at some point in time is going to say, okay, that's enough. And those that are truly saved are going to be leaving. And you talk about a shock. You talk about a shock. What's the rapture going to be like? I'm telling you, most of the uh, church buildings out there, if the rapture happens on a Sunday morning, they won't even have their service disturbed. 
I'll hear an explosion. I'll go. They'll look around. And go. What was that? I don't know. Let's get back to the service. Okay. Everybody. Is everybody okay? Yeah. All right. Let's get back. Let's sing. And they'll put up some praise and worship music up there, and then they'll turn in their NIV Bibles to whatever else, and they get home and they realize, oh, a lot of people disappeared. I, I didn't know. You know? A lot of these church buildings don't have one saved person going to them. I'll grant you, there's probably still some out there that are still hanging on to these dead buildings that have no basis in the New Testament, but uh, it's because they're completely ignorant. But they're feeling it. You know, if you've gone to these church buildings, you know deep down in your gut you're going, I'm seeing things here that's just not right. And you go and you try another one and you try another one and you try another one. You know, you do that whole thing. But uh, truly saved people know that something's not right at those buildings. But let's continue. Verse 5. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things? And now ye know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. Now I've gone over this and over this and over this, so I'm not going to spend a huge amount of time on this, but what's going on here? Well, now you know what withholdeth that he, who's the he? The Antichrist there, the son of perdition that we just read about in verse 3 and then described in verse 4, that he might be revealed in his time. What's his time? Well, what time are we living in now? Most uh, Bible teachers will tell you that we are that are dispensational, that know what the Bible teaches. The non-dispensational people, you know, a lot of those aren't even saved. They're just just ridiculous. You know, they don't they don't know what the Bible teaches. But um, and you know, I'm not cutting on novices that don't really understand the scriptures. I'm talking about people that have been preaching. You know, men that have been preaching for years and years and years, and they proudly come out and say, "I'm non-dispensational." Yeah, well, so is the Pope. But, uh, you know, uh, those that teach and know the Bible will call this the church age. What is the church? Jesus loved the church and gave himself for it. The church is his body. This time period belongs to Jesus Christ. From his death, burial, resurrection to the resurrection of the body of Christ. It's his time. This time period where God has stopped dealing with Israel as a nation, nationally speaking, geographically speaking, that's interesting too, God has stopped dealing with that nation of Israel on a geographic, national, physical level. He said, okay, I'm going to put that off for just a little bit here. About 2,000 years later, the body of Christ leaves. The church age ends. And God starts to deal with the nation of Israel again. Okay, so the Antichrist is being withheld from showing up in the church age. Meaning what? The church age has to end before the Antichrist can show up. Let's keep reading. Verse 7, for the mystery of iniquity, iniquity doth already work. Uh, is the Roman Catholic Church already in power? Yes. Have they been for a long time? Yes. That mystery of iniquity is already working. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. Now people say, well, that's the Holy Spirit. Both references there. No, I don't believe it. That's quite true. Let me explain. He who now letteth will let. Who's that? The Holy Spirit. He is hindering there. You know, you know, uh, verse 6, you know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. That letting there, which means hindering, to stop. Uh, again, if you play tennis and you hit the ball and it whacks into the net, they say let. The net hindered, it stopped the ball from coming to the other person. That's what the word let means. So the Holy Spirit is letting, he is hindering the Antichrist from showing up. All right? Now, that man of sin, that position there, the son of perdition, that antichrist position, is held by the Pope of Rome. So they always have a man ready to step into the position of antichrist. But that exact man, the antichrist man, cannot be revealed until the body of Christ leaves. So the office is there, and they have a man running the office. But the actual man, the actual son of perdition there, cannot show up until the body of Christ is gone. 
So you can have a, a Roman Catholic that's raised Roman Catholic and that worships the Pope and takes the mark upon the forehead, you know, Ash Wednesday. You know, I, I saw a couple of Catholics just uh, a couple of weeks ago here or whatever, whenever this Ash Wednesday foolishness happened. And, you know, I was like walking out of the store and they come walking in. I was like, what? Oh, yeah, the Catholic thing. <laughs> like, what do they got on their forehead? You know, what in the world? Wash your face once in a while, you know? But, uh, and, but you see, you could have somebody that worships the Pope, that truly worships the Pope and thinks he's God on earth, and it takes the ash mark upon the forehead and things like this. They're not going to be damned. You see? A Roman Catholic like that can get saved. They can come to Jesus Christ and say, I'm sorry about all that Catholic garbage in the past there. I put my faith in you, Jesus Christ. You're the one who died for my sin, not some dirty pope. You know, he's not leading a system that you founded. All right, that system has no basis in, in the New Testament. They can do that. See, the Antichrist is, or excuse me, the Pope is sitting in the position of the Antichrist, but he is not the Antichrist. And he cannot, they cannot reveal that true son of perdition, that true Antichrist, until we leave as the body of Christ. Look at this. He who now letteth will let, Holy Spirit, until he be taken out of the way. And see, people will say it can't be the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit's omnipresent. That's correct. But who's the he that's taken out of the way? The body of Christ. See, we're in his time right now, the church age, the body of Christ. The Holy Spirit is there withholding that Antichrist. He's saying, not yet, not yet, not yet. But when his time is complete, the body of Christ, and the body of Christ, he is taken out of the way, now... Yes, the Holy Spirit is still omnipresent. He's still there. But in dwelling uniquely in the bodies of believers, that's done. You see, because when we leave, a new dispensation begins. And that new dispensation, people will have the Holy Spirit. But, but if they take the mark and worship that beast in his image, they lose the Holy Spirit and they go to hell. Read Revelation chapter 14, verses 9 through 12. They have to have the faith of Jesus and keep the commandments. That is salvation in that time of Jacob's trouble for the majority of people. There will be 144,000 Jews from each of the 12 tribes. 144,000, 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes. Excuse me. They're sealed. Okay. The rest aren't. Big difference. But let's continue reading here. Uh, verse 8, and, when the, and then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. Okay? Now, let me just stop there again. Now, notice here. Paul, back in verse 3, gives two things that have to happen before the second coming which is what I believe there, the day of Christ, is a reference to, in context. I don't see how you can get the rapture out of that. You have to kind of tweak the scriptures a bit. I hold to the thing of the day of Christ is a reference to the second coming. Paul says there are two things. There's a falling away first. We're in that right now. The man of sin is revealed. And then he goes on to say, but the man of sin cannot be revealed until the body of Christ is gone. Now, if, if people are troubled... By this thing of saying people saying that the, the the day of Christ is at hand, what would be the way to ease their tensions and get them calmed back down? To say, well, you know, uh, the two things that have to happen: the falling away is going to happen, and the man of sin is going to be revealed. Well, if the man of sin is revealed while the body of Christ is still on the earth, you could take the mark and lose your salvation, making God into a liar. If you read Ephesians chapter one, it doesn't work. So what Paul is saying is there's going to come a falling away first and in the midst of that falling away, before the Antichrist can be revealed, the body of Christ is leaving. We go bye-bye. Why? Because it gets so wicked at this point in time where we are right now and you look at things like the Hillsong Church and Rick Warren and Joel Osteen and all this other stuff, replacement theology and all this other wickedness. The Roman Catholic system is disgusting. And you look at all that stuff and you say, how long do we have to put up with this? You know, the Bible also talks about judgment beginning at the house of God. Guess where that judgment is going to happen in the future? 
the rapture is a judgment of God, separating those who are truly saved from those who are false converts. And there isn't going to be any time to repent. When the rapture happens, it is in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. Like that. Up you go. Dead in Christ, we which are alive and remain. Call up. There's no time to you start seeing your saved loved one and they start to kind of hover up slowly and you go, what's happening? And they go, it's the rapture. You better get saved. Okay, I'll get saved quick. <laughs> There's no time. There's no time. And that judgment that's coming upon the wicked religions of this world, when that happens and the body of Christ leaves, nobody is going to say, you are judging me. You're judgmental. I'm a Christian. How dare you judge my salvation? Playtime's over. Okay? Your little pretend little Christianity, it's done. It's finished. And if you're a post-tribber and you're not genuinely saved, you haven't come to God in a broken, contrite, repentant spirit of saying, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. If you haven't done that and you're calling people like me a heretic, I believe in easy believism. It's just a prayer. You just believe. You don't even have to pray a prayer. You know, some of these people... If you're, if you're teaching that and you hit that time period and you're staying down here on the earth, there's no more little videos that you can do, no more little theological discussion, no more, well, I think that you can be saved and still continue in sin, but you can, because we can prove certain people that were in sin in the New Testament, blah, 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 blah. Man, you, you better make sure that you're saved. You better do whatever you have to do. Get down on your knees and stay down on your knees until you know that you are saved. It's incredible, some of these people. We're going to come back to the text here in just a minute, but I want to show you a couple things here about this proving that the body of Christ has to leave before the Antichrist can be revealed. I'm going to prove it to you. Turn to John, the book of John, chapter 10. John chapter 10, beginning in verse 1. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. Interesting. When we come back with Jesus, who's leading? at the second coming, Jesus. And he comes with his mighty angels behind him. A flock of sheep, but they're mighty angels. How interesting. Verse 5, And a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. This parable spake Jesus unto them, but they understood not what things they were which he spake unto them. But I thought he was describing to them the second coming. And the second coming passages all throughout the Old Testament. Why didn't they understand him? Because Jesus is giving the first reference to the rapture of the bride of Christ. He's talking about something else. Let's continue. Verse 7, Then said Jesus unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out, and find pasture. Oh boy, get a hold of that one. I want you to remember the verse there, verse 9. I am the, what? Door. Picture a door. Remember that. They shall go in. Come up hither. We go up. And out. We come back down. The second coming. The mighty angels coming down with Jesus. And what do we get? We find pasture. What is the millennial kingdom? It is an agrarian, thousand-year kingdom. Agrarian meaning it's farming. Organic farming. <laughs> On a massive scale, it's never been seen before. Horses and animals drawing the plows and things like this. You can watch my study on the millennial kingdom about that. Showing you scripture after scripture after scripture where it's vineyards and planting and fruits and vegetables and harvest and things. That's what it is. We find pasture. That's what's going on here. Verse 10. 
The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. It, do you have an abundant life if you're thinking that you're going through the time of Jacob's trouble and you could lose your salvation? Is that abundant life? Is that peace? No. So what does the thief do? The post-trib thieves. I did three messages on that many years ago. Never had to repent of anything that I said in that. The thief comes and he steals. He steals your joy. Or steals your rewards, excuse me. He kills your joy and he destroys. No, okay, I got that order wrong. He steals from the Jews. He kills your uh, joy and he destroys your rewards at the judgment seat of Christ. That's how I had the thing worked out. Verse 11, I am the good shepherd and the... Uh, I am the good shepherd, the good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. But he that is an hireling, and not the shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming, and leaveth the sheep, and fleeth, and the wolf catcheth them, and scattereth the sheep. The hiring, hireling fleeth, because he is an hireling, and careth not for the sheep. All post-trib pastors are hirelings. That's what they are, every single one of them. Tell them I said so. Jason Cooley, Stephen Anderson, Kenneth... Or, uh, yeah, Kenneth. Kenneth Hagen. Oh, he probably was too. I don't know. Um, Ken Hoven. That's the one I was thinking about. Joe Schimmel. All post-tribbers. They're all heretics. They're all hirelings. And if you think that they're going to be around when the Antichrist shows up to lead people boldly against... I don't think so. Jim Baker. You know. <laughs> He's got his money from selling you buckets full of junk. He's going to be heading for the hills. Verse 14, I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and am known of mine. As the Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, that them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. Hmm. In the body of Christ, there's neither Jew nor Gentile. We're all one in Christ. There's one fold. Jesus is speaking to Jews, and he says, Verse 16, other sheep I have which are not of this fold. What's he talking about? He's saying, I have other sheep that are not Jews. They're Gentiles. And we're all going to be one. He's talking about the rapture, not about the second coming. Now remember, verse 9, I am the door. Remember that part of this passage. Go next to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 51 and 52. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. There's only two references to this word trump. A trump is not a trumpet. It's the voice of the trumpet. That's very important to understand. Keep that in mind. First, or, uh, First Thessalonians chapter 4. Go there next. It's a moment in the twinkling of an eye that we just read about there in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 51. It's a moment. It happens quickly. And there's a trump that sounded. Let's see what that trump is. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16 through 18. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the Trump of God. All post tribbers get messed up on this. They'll say, we'll see the trump of God there. That's the same. That's the seventh angel trumpet that we see. The trumpet blaring in Matthew chapter 24. It's the same thing. They can't read plain English. It says the trump of God in our text. Matthew 24, it's an angel blowing a trumpet. It's not the same thing. Interesting. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Verse 17, Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. That's what I've been doing since I've been in ministry. Way back in November of 2008, when I first got on YouTube, and I've been comforting people with these exact words. We're going up. We are not appointed to God's wrath. We are not appointed to that time of Jacob's trouble. We're leaving beforehand in spite of what all the little post-trib sissy heretics try to tell you. And I'll call them sissies because none of them have the guts to try and come after me. 
they'll just kind of not mention me by name. They're sissies. And they're heretics because it's a Roman Catholic teaching. This thing of a post-trib rapture. The church has to go through more purification. See, Catholics can't believe that you go and you leave instantly and you're immediately with the Lord. Why? They have their doctrine of purgatory. They believe in Christians having to suffer. Co-sufferers with Christ. In order to merit salvation, too, by the way. Not because you're suffering to be rewarded because you suffer as a Christian. Oh, no being persecuted by the world. No, they're talking about suffering as in whipping yourself, flagellating yourself, things like this. That's a Catholic teaching. Roman Catholics believe in a post-trib, well, uh, I shouldn't say post-trib rapture. They believe that you go through the time of Jacob's trouble. That's a Catholic teaching. That's why you'll see post-trib heretics coming out and saying the historic position of the church has not been the pre-trib rapture. They're being honest. Because their church is Roman Catholicism. That's why I call them sissy heretics. They don't have the guts to go after real pre-trib preachers. They just play little word games. And you think that any of those guys are going to have the guts to actually stand against the Antichrist when they're left behind at the rapture? <laughs> are you kidding me? That's why so many of these little sissy post-tribber heretics are coming out and saying, I think that you could probably take the mark of the beast and still be saved. You know why? Because they're going to take the mark of the beast. That's why. And if you're dumb enough to follow them, you're going to take the mark of the beast too. They are blind and they are leading the blind and you're both going to fall into the ditch. The ditch is hell. You take the mark of the beast, you will go to hell. Revelation 14, verses 9 through 11 makes that crystal clear. You better not listen to post-trib heretics. They are leading you astray. They are the worst of the worst in terms of false prophets. Because they are trying to get you into a time where you can take the mark of the beast and you lose your salvation. You are damned to hell. That's what they want. just disgusts me. You, see, you shouldn't get so mad about it. I'm going to get mad about it because it deals about people's salvation. But let's continue here. I'll show you proof that the body of Christ is in heaven before the Antichrist is unleashed. Now remember, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, we read two references to the word trump. It's the voice, the sound that a trumpet makes. It's a voice. Revelation chapter 4. What did John see? Or what did Jesus say? Excuse me. What did Jesus say back in John chapter 10, verse 9? He said, I am the door. Remember? Revelation chapter 4, verse 1. After this, I looked and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me which said come up hither and I will show thee things which must be hereafter and immediately I was in the spirit and behold a throne was set in heaven and one sat on the throne up he goes sees a door in heaven and he hears a voice calling him up how can you not see that And you get the post -tribbers. I don't believe it teaches that. Well, you're lost. You're lost. The Holy Spirit is going to guide you into all truth. If you can't see something so plain and so obvious, you're not saved. Don't blame the Holy Spirit for your stupidity. Revelation chapter 5. Get offended. Go ahead. Write the comments. Revelation chapter 5, verse 9. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. These are not Old Testament saints. They're Christians. John goes up. Chapter 4. Chapter 5. Blood-redeemed saints in heaven. Keep reading. Verse 10. And hast made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. Millennial reign promised to Christians who suffer because of their stands for Jesus Christ. If we suffer, we shall also reign with Him. 
These are Christians that this is writing about. Verse 11, And I beheld and heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and the beast, and the beasts and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000, and thousands of thousands, many angels. What did we read earlier? Jesus Christ comes back with his mighty angels. The Lord cometh with 10,000 of his saints. Did you get it? Do you understand? The bride adorned in pure white linen, the righteousness of the saints. I saw an army in heaven in white linen coming with Jesus. When did they go up? Halfway through the tribulation. <sighs> These people, I'll tell you. Revelation chapter 6. The Lamb opens this first seal. And who is, comes out in verse 2? Well, that would be the Antichrist. The uh, white horse rider that tries to uh, be a counterfeit of Jesus Christ but doesn't quite get it. Jesus comes and he has many, many crowns on his head. This guy comes and I saw and behold a white horse and he that sat on him had a bow and a, and a crown was given unto him and he went forth conquering and to conquer. That's the Antichrist. Jesus opens the seal and unleashes the Antichrist. After there's the body of Christ that goes up and they're in heaven and they're crowned and they have their millennial reign all fixed, ready to go and they sit down for the show. This is going to be entertaining. Seven years of God's judgment coming down upon the earth. All those people that mocked you. All those uh, wicked people out there that laughed and made fun of Christians and made fun of Jesus Christ. We're going to get to see their judgment for seven years. The Jesuits. All those child molesting perverts. We're going to see them judged seven years. Well, you say, oh no, Brother Brian, because you see, they have underground bases, deep underground military bases, dumbs. You know, it's kind of funny. You know, the acronym, acronym for deep underground military base is dumb. And you are rather dumb if you think that you can get away from Jesus Christ. I'm going to dig a hole in the ground and I'm going to put 20 feet concrete doors and it's going to be a bunker and we're going to have survival water and we're going to have all this other stuff. And you think God doesn't see you down there? You are dumb. You are very stupid. You know, and a lot of Christians are getting into this thing of fearing the Antichrist and, and the, oh, the Jesuits and the, the Illuminati and stuff, and they're dangerous people. But you know what? We're connected to God. We're the body of Christ. What do we have to fear? Well, they might come kill you, Brian. Go ahead. I get a martyr's reward. That'd be rather dumb, wouldn't it? And you think I'm worried about a bunch of stupid Jesuits coming and killing me or my wife? No. Not worried about it. You know why? Because they're gonna have to get through God first. <sighs> but let's go back to our text. Second Thessalonians chapter two. Yeah, I get worked up. You don't like that, you like the Joel Osteen type that doesn't get worked up and doesn't break a sweat when he preaches or doesn't spit towards the camera or anything like that because he's yelling. <laughs> then this is the wrong place for you. Probably ought to go check out somebody else. Start at, uh, where do we end here? Verse 10. We'll go to there. Verse 10. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion, that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. You say, well, you see, the body of Christ is going to go into the time of Jacob's trouble. The tribulation. We'll use that term. Um, okay, so God's going to actually send strong delusion upon saved and lost. There are Christians that don't love the truth. There are Christians that have gotten them far away from the Lord and they're messing around with the world and whatever else. Absolutely. God's going to send them strong delusion that they all might be damned. Hmm. You and I both know that every Christian out there, every truly saved Christian, they're not all walking 100% in the truth. Sometimes it's, it's willful ignorance. Sometimes it's just they're innocent. They're ignorant. They don't know all the deception. None of us really does. I mean, there's so much deception in our world today right now. It's just incredible. 
why would God send any of us strong delusion that we might be damned? Get up there to heaven, and he says, you're going to hell. Why? You believe the strong delusion that I sent you. You weren't loving every bit of the truth there, so I'd send you strong delusion. You say, you look at God and you say, and you're a liar. Why? Ephesians chapter 1 says we're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise until the day of redemption. You liar. You said we're sealed. Now you're damning me to hell? You sent me the strong delusion? You're a liar and a deceiver, God. That's what you could say if Christians go into that time of Jacob's trouble. You see, the satanic spirit behind post-tribism, you see it? That's why I get so rabid and so vicious against it. And I've had a lot of grace over the years saying to people, you know, well, there are people that are post-trib that are saved and things like that. And I still think you get somebody who's totally green, just got saved, they're novice, they've never really heard the arguments. I think it's some of those people are saved, you know, sure, absolutely. But teachers of the post-trib thing? Nope, sorry. Sorry. Sam Adams, I, I didn't name him earlier. He's another little wing nut. Replacement theology, probably Jesuit. You know? Or Jesuit temporal coadjutor. Or a coadjutor, depending on how you want to say it. In other words, they're working for the Jesuits. They're carrying out, you know, Jesuit uh, uh, means of propaganda and things like that. That's what they're doing. To help out with the uh, temporal, the physical rule of the Jesuits, false prophets, false, false preachers coming out and proposing and, and putting forth the, the teachings of the Jesuit order. They're all over the place and they're coming after the Bible believing movement too, as I discussed in my interview with Eric John Phelps. They're very interested in infiltrating our circles as King James Bible believers. Be on your guard, Christian. Somebody comes out and they start telling you about that you're going to go through this time of Jacob's trouble, they are lying to you. They are a deceiver. And if they're pridefully teaching it and they have no desire to repent of that thing and they, have, they just refuse and they say, well, I'm sorry, we're just going to go through it. We're going to go through it. You're dealing with a false convert. No saved man is going to pridefully cling to that false doctrine. Not going to happen. Turn to John chapter 16, verse 13. John chapter 16, verse 13. Howbeit, when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. But our text over here in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, uh, verse 11 says, For this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Now how can we go into a time period where that verse applies to the people? And yet over here in John 16, 13, it says that uh, the Spirit of truth comes, He leads us into all truth. And it's interesting too there, it says... Uh, he will show you things to come. The Holy Spirit will bear witness to this book. He will bear witness to the pre-time of Jacob's trouble catching away of the bride of Christ. The popular term, of course, as I've said in many studies, is pre-tribulation rapture. But the real, true, biblical description is the time of Jacob's trouble is the time that's coming. So it is before that time, the pre-time of Jacob's trouble catching away, which is what's going to happen to the body of Christ. The Holy Spirit will show it to you. You can't be post-trib or pre-trib or pre-wrath post-trib or what all this other nonsense is. You will be pre-trib using that terminology. You'll believe that you're going out before the time of Jacob's trouble if you're saved. Why? Because the Spirit of Truth will show it to you. Not Brian Denlinger and his phenomenal preaching. Not uh, Greg Miller or uh, James Knox or Doug Stauffer or Sam Gipp or Peter Ruckman or whoever. No, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Truth will come and He will guide you into the truth. Let's continue. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13 through 17. Now notice the distinction again. When Paul is writing about this time period, 
that we are currently living in. Those people who receive not the love of the truth, they that sleep, sleep in the night. They that are drunken are drunken in the night. You know, he's showing there's a big distinction between the two. And he does it again here. Verses 10 through 12. Those people that don't love the truth, God sends them a strong delusion that they might be, be damned, who believe not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Verse 13. But we, the saved Christians, are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren beloved of the Lord. Beloved of the Lord. Not going into the time of Jacob's trouble. Because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. When the Spirit of truth is come, He guides you into all truth. Verse 14, Whereunto He called you by our gospel, to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, brethren, stand fast, and hold the traditions which ye have been taught, whether by word or our epistle. Now remember the context of this. These people are thinking to themselves, we missed the rapture. We're heading for the second coming. They think that they're going through the time of Jacob's trouble. And Paul's going, no, no, no. We have to leave before the Antichrist can even show up. And by the way, there's going to come a falling away first. The first century was not seeing a falling away. They were getting stronger and stronger and stronger as Christians. The following, falling away right now is getting worse and worse. These wicked satanic Babel buildings are doing things that nobody would have dreamed of doing even 10 years ago. We are in the falling away. But the Antichrist, the man of sin, cannot be revealed until we, the body of Christ, leave. That's what's going on. And Paul is reassuring them of that. He's saying it right here in the text. Verse 16. Now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father, which hath loved us and hath given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. It's a comfort to know we're leaving. At some point in time before the Antichrist is unleashed, before the mark of the beast, before people are losing their salvation and cannot get it back, because they took the, be took the mark, worshipped the beast in his image, before that time comes, we're leaving. That should establish you. That should set you firm in your convictions and say, my labor is not in vain. I don't have to worry about one day waking up and all of a sudden, boom, news, big news flash here. This man showed up and he's requiring everybody to take a mark and worship the man. I don't have to worry about that. I'm leaving. Goodbye. The stands that we take, the sufferings that we've been through, it's all going to go through the fire at the judgment seat of Christ. And what you've done for the Lord, it will come out as rewards. Both rewards there, crowns of, of, of uh, reward, but also millennial kingdom reign. It's going to come out. But you don't have that if you're a post-tribber. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may have free course and be glorified even as it is with you. Notice it's the word of the Lord, the written word that's supposed to be glorified. Oh, you're a bibliolater. You worship the King James Bible. Well, I don't worship it in the sense of putting it on a pedestal someplace and bowing down to it and offering up prayers and incense to it. But I'll tell you what, I exalt this book. I glorify this book. This is God's book, if you're an English-speaking Christian. This is His book. Not Greek texts that don't have much uh, use for people out there in the world. It's the book. That's what you're going to get from this ministry. King James Video Ministries is all about the book. Verse 2, And that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men, for all men have not faith. I love that. You know what? I look forward to the day that I am delivered from the unreasonable and wicked post-tribbers. You know why? They have not faith. That's ridiculous. We have faith that Jesus died for our sins. You have faith Jesus died for your sins, but you don't have faith that He can deliver you from the time of Jacob's trouble? The Holy Spirit of promise sealed you until the day of redemption, but not really. 
You don't have faith. Don't tell me that you can come to Jesus Christ with faith. I believe that He died for my sins, and I believe that that's all sufficient to pay for my sins, and yet He can't deliver me for the time of Jacob's trouble. And I could go into that time period and take the mark and lose my salvation, thereby making God a liar. You don't have faith. You post-trib little sissy heretics, whatever else you want to call them, little adjectives, whatever names and things. You don't have faith. You're looking for the Antichrist. You're looking for the mark of the beast. Well, I, I just want to make sure. I, I want to be prepared for both situations. I just want to make sure. And just in case Jesus doesn't come and take us out of here, I want to make sure I have enough uh, food and things stocked up to survive the seven years. You don't have faith. You are living by sight. You don't have faith. You are unreasonable and wicked. That's what you are. You're not going to be a good soul winner. You're not going to live for the Lord thinking that you have to survive the time that's coming. You're a prepper. These preppers and things like that. You know what they do? They spend all their time preparing and stockpiling and stockpiling and stockpiling. You know why? They don't have faith. They have to live by sight. You say, oh, now, come on. What gives you joy as a prepper? Believing in Jesus by faith, looking and saying, I have just enough food to get by for a little while here. But you know what? My Lord, my Savior, Jesus Christ, will provide for me. I have faith that He will. I believe the Lord will take care of all my needs. Does that give you joy as a, po as a uh, post trib prepper? You know, it doesn't. You know what gives you joy? Going down there to that underground little storage vault or your basement or some survival cabin somewhere or something else like that and looking at all your little stockpile of goodies, all your MREs and your bulletproof vests and your gas masks and all this other stuff and looking at all that stuff and going, oh, I'm prepared. You're unreasonable. You're wicked. You don't have faith. And you'll make fun of pre-tribbers saying, oh, you think you're just going to have no problems and you're going to have... I have faith that the Lord can deliver me through anything. Put that in your pipe and smoke it. Second Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 5. And the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into the patient waiting for the new world order. Oh, no, I didn't read that right. Into the patient waiting for the mark of the beast. Oh, Citibank is passing. Uh, huh? No, it says the patient waiting for Christ. Are you looking for Jesus Christ? Are you patient? Jesus should have come by now. He, he should have been here in 1993. So then the, the tribulation could have been seven years and we had the 2,000 year, you know, would have started the millennial kingdom. He should have been here. Who didn't come? Oh no. Well, he should have come in 2001 and he should have come in, in, in this year and that year and stuff in May 12th of 2012 and, and December 12th of 2012 and or 21st or whatever that Mayan stupid nonsense was. And he should have come September 23rd of 2015. And oh, what are you doing? You're not patiently waiting for Jesus Christ. You know, there's a lot of you watching right now that can shout a great amen saying, I'm glad Jesus waited. I'm glad Jesus didn't come back in 1993. You know why? If Jesus came back in 1993, I would be, I, excuse me, I would have gone through the time of Jacob's trouble. I was a false convert. How many of you just got saved within the last year? Aren't you glad that Jesus was patient? Aren't you glad that the Lord is long-suffering? Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance? Aren't you glad? You know what? He's still patient. He's still waiting for those souls to be saved before that body of Christ is complete. Before that last sheep is ready to come in to the fold. Go through the door and be safe. I mean, do you think the they have the pen there? Imagine the pen, the fenced-in area and things, and Jesus is there. He's the door. And He goes, you want to come in? I'll keep you safe. 
And Jesus lets them all come in there and then He says, okay, Antichrist, come on in. Take what you want. Is that the kind of Savior that you serve? Not my Savior. When the body of Christ is complete, goodbye world. We'll be back in seven years. And those of you that are left, you better do some nice things. Towards the end there, read Matthew chapter 25. Visiting the homeless and the people in prison and those that are sick and things like that. You better do some good stuff because you're going to go through the judgment of the nations. But my Savior, I have faith that He's going to provide for me. I live by faith. The just shall live by faith, the Bible says. Faith is the evidence of things not seen. How do you reconcile that stuff if you're a post-trib prepper? Interesting. We are to have patient waiting for Christ, brethren. Verse 6. Now we command you. Command. Brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly, and not after the tradition which he received of us. You know, one of the famous little lines of the post-trib heretics is they say, there's no mention of a, a rapture before 1830. Uh, actually, yes, I do know a pre-tribber before 1830. His name is the Apostle Paul. The tradition that he received, that we have received of Paul, is that we're going to be leaving before the time of Jacob's trouble. I'm patiently waiting for Jesus Christ. I'm not patiently waiting for the Antichrist. And how can you patiently wait for the Antichrist? It'd be an anxious waiting. It'd be a scared, a fearful waiting for the Antichrist. You see? And you say, but it could mean that we go into the time of Jacob's trouble and that we have to patiently wait for Jesus Christ. Let's go with that for a minute. Wouldn't you be able to tell? How could you patiently wait for Jesus Christ if you are in the time of Jacob's trouble? You know when he's coming. You say, well, the Bible says no man knoweth the day or the hour. That's correct, but you know the year. The Antichrist signs that peace treaty. You go, seven years. What's the day or the hour? Well, we don't know. Jesus shortens the days in that time period. So we don't know the day or the hour, but you know the year. So how could that verse of Scripture there line up for you if you are in the time of Jacob's trouble? I'll give you a hint. It can't. So what do we do as Christians? You get around people that are post-trib and radically post-trib and they refuse to change. You know what you do? Withdraw yourselves. Get away from them. Sorry, I can't fellowship with you anymore. You know, we had uh, years ago Bible Believers Fellowship. We had a house church back down there in Pennsylvania and I was pastoring it and things and uh, Brother Jesse Lesky was uh, the deacon, basically. He was essentially another elder. I, we didn't have the system worked out. I've... I've I had things to learn. You know, I'll admit to that. I've, I've, I wasn't perfect. Still not perfect either. Um, but, <laughs> but I remember there was this guy. We called him Crazy Charlie. And uh, he turned out to be quite crazy. And uh, he came. He had InfoWars stickers all over the back of his car, you know, and everything. And, and it just something. As soon as I started talking to the guy, I was like, something's really wrong with this guy. And, of course, he was trying to tell us things that we, he thought that we wanted to hear. And I said about the rapture issue. And he was like, well, I'd have to disagree. I am a post-tribber. And I was like, well, what about the Bible saying this? And, that? and it was just like he was just dead set against the pre-trib rapture. And I said to him, uh, sorry, but you can't attend Bible Believers Fellowship. And he said, you, you won't let me attend over the rapture issue? I said, no. Sorry. You're not welcome here. And people say, well, that's a radical thing. We, should, we shouldn't disagree over something of such minor doctrine. Oh, friend, let me tell you something. The rapture issue is major doctrine. It's major doctrine. And the more I read the Bible, the more I see this subject and read and study about this subject, the more I'm convinced that it is the most important thing. You say, well, I thought salvation. Isn't salvation more important? The rapture is our salvation. That's why in the Romans study I brought out the scripture where Paul says, now is our salvation nearer than when we first believed. You see, our salvation is complete with Jesus Christ. Jesus says, 
I am the resurrection and the life. I am the door. You get it? Our salvation is completed at the rapture. We go up to be with Him. The redemption of the purchased possession. Somebody rejects the pre-trib rapture, they're in essence rejecting Jesus Christ. Well, let's finish up here. Verse 13 through 16. Here's a good one. Keep this one in mind, brethren. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 13. But ye, brethren, be not weary in well-doing. Amen. It gets rough sometimes. Don't be weary in well-doing. Verse 14. And if any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man. Stephen Anderson, Ken Hoven, Joe Schimmel, Sam Adams, uh, Jason Cooley, anybody who's post-trib, anybody. Note that man and have no company with him that he may be ashamed. Yet count him not as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. All those people have done that at first. I have given grace to every single post-tribber I've ever had a debate with, ever had, had discussion back and forth with. I've tried to have grace for them and treat them as a brother at first. But after a while, you start to see they're not a brother because they're coming out with more doctrines that are dangerous. And I've seen people, I have, I have countless friends of the ministry that were post-trib. And they went pre-trib. Why? They hear the arguments. And after they see the arguments, it's just a plain as day that the Holy Spirit guides them into that truth. Not Brian Denlinger. Not some other book that I have here by Dr. Ruckman or Sam Gipp or, or uh, Doug Stauffer. I saw Doug Stauffer and another brother came out with a book defending the uh, Blessed Hope, the Rapture. Praise the Lord. That's great. But it's not going to be Doug Stauffer Dr. Douglas Stauffer, that convinces you of the rapture, being before the time of Jacob's trouble. It's going to be the Holy Spirit of truth. He's the one that leads you into all truth. These videos are not going to convince you through my words. It's going to be the Holy Spirit. And if you are a brother or a sister and you're post-trib currently, the Holy Spirit's going to convict you of that. You're not my enemy. I'm admonishing you as a brother or a sister. I get radical and I say things that might be insulting to you, but it's because I want you to wake up out of your slumber, out of your deception that you've been put under. That's what I want you to do. But if you are rabidly post-trib and you refuse to repent of that, and you just keep on with it and keep on with it and keep on with it, you're not my brother or sister in Christ. Yes, it's that serious of a doctrine. Verse 16. Now the Lord of peace himself give you peace, always, by all means. The Lord be with you all. The Lord Jesus Christ will give you peace. You know, a study like this, you get done with this thing and you're a pre-trib believer, and you think, boy, those scriptures, just scripture after scripture after scripture after scripture, proving that we leave before the time of Jacob's trouble. You know, there's an old hymn, What joy, O delight, or delight, should we go without dying? No sickness, no pain. Uh, I'm getting the lyrics mixed up. But, you know, called up with, through the clouds with our Lord into glory. When Jesus receives his own, O oh, Lord Jesus, how long, how long, ere we shout that glad song, Christ returneth, hallelujah, hallelujah, amen. Wouldn't it be amazing if it happened today? You're there and you're having a rough time and your siblings are fighting you, your family members are fighting you, your husband or wife might be fighting you if you're saved and they're not. People at work making fun of you, you got bills to pay, you got sickness, you got headache. And all of a sudden you hear your name. A voice like a trumpet. The trump of God. And you go up. And then we meet the other saints 
We all meet together. And then we see Jesus for the first time. That's a comfort. That's a beautiful thing. And that will give you peace no matter what you go through. You know, let's just say for a minute that America gets taken over, that there's an economic collapse, martial law kicks in, all this other stuff before we leave, before the rapture. And they come around, they round up the body of Christ, they round up all the Christians, and they put us in camps, and the Jesuits are running the camps, and uh, they're going to torture us. And you're right in the middle of torture, and you're screaming in pain and things like that. And I pray that that stuff doesn't happen, but let's just assume this for a minute. What's going to give you peace in that time? Understanding that you're going to go through seven years of God's wrath coming in the future if you survive the torture? Or understanding that Jesus could come and all your suffering's over just like that? That peace that comes by all means has always been there for the body of Christ knowing the imminency. Jesus could come. He could come. He might come today. Perhaps today. That's the peace that will be there by all means. No matter what you're going through, you can have peace understanding that it could all end the day. All your problems, over, solved. We get to go up there and look down on this earth and go, this is going to be good. All those wicked people down there that have mocked Jesus Christ and have tortured and raped little children and things within the Catholic Church and all this satanic ritual abuse and all the secret societies and all this and all this wickedness and we're going to get to watch God just pour out His judgment and His fury on it for seven years. If you've led, been led into this post-trib stuff and you made it through this whole study, I pray that the Holy Spirit is convicting you big time right now. I pray that the Holy Spirit gets through that thick skull of yours as uh, He has many, many people and that you return to what the Bible truly teaches. Never mind the church fathers. They're Catholic. Catholics are the ones that quote the church fathers. What do we got to do to quote the church fathers? You know, some guy back in the 2, 300 A.D. or something like that, who cares what he said? We have the New Testament. It's a Catholic teaching, this Catholic practice of, well, if the Holy Scriptures say one thing and our church says another, we have to go to another source. Perhaps what do the church fathers say? You see? That's a Catholic teaching. We have God's Word, and God's Word teaches that the body of Christ is leaving beforehand, before this time of Jacob's trouble comes, before Daniel's 70th week. We do not have to face it, and that should give you peace. Let's close with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank You, Lord, for uh, another amazing study through Your Word that You uh, showed me a lot of these scriptures this morning. Lord, it's just crystal clear. It becomes clearer all the time to me that the body of Christ is leaving. And I thank You, Lord, for Your precious promises and that we can know that our salvation will be complete when You catch us out of here and we're given our incorruptible bodies. And uh, to know, Lord, that You are going to answer this world, this world that mocks you, this world that puts you down, this world that uh, just spits upon your word. I thank you, Lord, that we're going to be able to see your judgment come upon them. And Lord, I just pray if there are any people out there that are lost, that are unsaved, that they would realize, Lord, the truth of this. It's very, very serious. It's coming to pass. Your word, Lord, the New Testament prophecies are being fulfilled. A lot of Jews out there, Lord, have been led to believe that the New Testament is a false book. Then how can it prophesy these events so, so perfectly? How can it predict things that are going to happen in the future, way before they happen? No other writings do that with the level of accuracy of this King James Bible, this New Testament. And I just pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would help them to realize the imminency of your return and that they need to get saved quickly or they're going to go into your wrath. And I just ask it all in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. That's going to be it for this study. Next week we're going to be in 1 Timothy. And um, I'll tell you what, I just, these studies, you know, I, I've been a pre-trib 
you know, defender for many, many years now, since the very beginning of my ministry, uh, since going full-time way back in 2008. And um, I'll tell you, it just, I, don't, I just don't see how people cannot see it. I really don't, you know. And I, it just, you know, a lot of these scriptures the Lord's been showing me in these studies, I never used them before because I just, I never, you know, I know the main arguments for and against the rapture issue and things, you know, pre-trib, post-trib. I know the issue. I've, I've heard all the arguments. Uh, this is, I mean, this is my, the, the big thing for me. You know, I, I, yes, I stand for the King James Bible. Yes, I know the textual issue and I know, you know, things about Roman Catholicism and I know, I know a lot of things like that. Yeah, sure, I have a level of expertise there, but uh, this is this, this is the subject that I know best of all. And uh, there's just no argument. And boy, I tell you, the more you go through the Pauline epistles, the more it's just like, it's right there. Crystal clear. You cannot come away post-trib. Just not possible. And um, just stand, brethren. Don't let people uh, back you down. And, and uh, you know, yeah, there's some videos out there that are good. You know, you can watch them and stuff like that. And and you can see bad things happening, all the animals dying and, and Mark of the Beast type technology stuff coming and all that. But uh, we're to be patiently waiting for Jesus Christ. Uh, you know, I mean, it'd be kind of like if I was away for a while and uh, my wife was here and by herself and, um, and she could see some bad things coming. And she's going, well, I sure wish my husband would get here. I sure wish my... You know, the love of my life, my husband. I know he'll protect me from this stuff. I say, well, it's it's going to happen really soon. These bad things are going to happen. Yeah, but my husband's going to be here. You don't worry. I know he'll be here. He'll he'll rescue me from this thing. That's the way we're supposed to feel about Jesus Christ. But you don't. You're not supposed to look at the world and go, oh no, this is really going to be bad for me. And oh, I'm not going to make it. Our husband from heaven, Jesus Christ, He's coming. Don't worry about it. Okay? Your job is to witness to people, to uh, live as a Christian here on this earth, and to you know, pass out gospel tracts, you know, and, and, and read your Bible. Pray. You know, and, and trust the Lord. He won't let you down. So that is going to be it. Thank you very much for watching, and we will see you next week in our study of 1 Timothy. And I know that the Lord's going to show us even more scriptures that prove a pre-trib rapture. That's going to be it. See you next week.